What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another episode of the Forgotten Race Review. Today, at the request of Lord of Death Gaming, we're cracking open that advanced race guide. We're talking about the drow, noble, or otherwise. And hey, if you guys are liking what you're seeing, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If there's a race you want to hear all about, throw it in the comments. Today, this episode of the Forgotten Race Review was brought to you in part by our newest patron, none other than Archon. My friend, thanks so much for helping us grow. We've grown so much in the past few months that it's still just unreal to me. We're almost at the benchmark where we're going to start publishing our own third-party content for Pathfinder 1st and 2nd Edition. It's crazy. We're right there, and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much, my friend. Now let's hit it. Alrighty, so the story of the Dark Elves, and the story there is, goes all the way back to the Prose Edda with the Svartalfar. This directly translates to Black Elves, Swarthy Elves, and these guys are also known as Mirkalfar, or Dusky Elves, Murky Elves, etc. These beings are said to have dwelled in Svartalheim. Both these places are primarily attested, like we said, in the Prose Edda written in the 13th century by Snorri Sturluson. And since the Prose Edda does in fact describe our Dark Elves as subterranean dwellers, it's possible that they may be dwarves under another name. Yeah, shocker. Blasphemy. I know it. In Dungeons and Dragons, the drow are generally evil dark-skinned and white-haired subrace of elves. And everything about these guys was invented by Gary Gygax, Except, of course, for that basic concept. The Drow are first mentioned in the Dungeons & Dragons game, 1st edition 1977, under the Elf entry, where it's stated that the Black Elves are only legend. There were no statistics there apart from the normal statistics for the Elves you would see. And ever since, they've been with us in every incarnation of Dungeons & Dragons, all the way up to the Pathfinder role-playing game as we know it. Eventually becoming a playable race. In Pathfinder, beneath the surface of the Inner Sea region, one can find the Darklands. And hey, if you want to learn more about that place, follow this card right up here. We'll take you to an old video, tell you all about it. And among the most potent and depraved of the great empires ruling the realm without the sun is that of the Drow. In Pathfinder, millennia ago, this thing called Earthfall happened, it was super bad, the Aboleths were angry, tried to kill us all. Elves were a little more prevalent on Galarian at the time. Some of them, in fact most of them, chose to flee to Castravel, their ancestral home, to escape this apocalypse. Some of them, however, did in fact go into the Darklands to escape, you know, gigantic meteor falling on our faces. Over time, their night vision sharpened and their skin took on hues suited to camouflaging themselves in the lightlessness of their new home. As they struggled against the predators of the Darklands, they developed new forms of warfare and new forms of hunting and magic, but even that wasn't enough. Their desperate leaders made fateful packs with demon lords sealed in blood to ensure the survival of their people and thus the drow came to flourish rising among abominations, and the merciless denizens of the dark to number among the most feared of the Darklands' tyrants. Today the drow bear very little spiritual resemblance to their elven forebears. Drow society is built on the backs of cruelly treated slaves whose labor allows drow rulers to pursue blasphemous ambitions and wage endless war on other denizens of the Darklands. The civilization's predominant great houses are largely run by all-powerful matriarchs who maintain an iron grip on the lives of the underclass, and private armies scheming against one another for territory, political clout, and economic influence. In other ways, the drow do in fact resemble their elven cousins. They are similarly sized, but with long, slender physiques and distinctively pointed elven ears. Their complexions are dark and bluish for camouflage, and their keen eyes appear to lack pupils, being either milky white or solid red, and provide them the ability to see in total darkness. 
Unfortunately, this sensory advantage does come with a price as bright lights leave drow blind and in pain. So drow societies are strictly matriarchal and a lot of times the males just don't have rights. This is reflected in the drow's height and weight. A male drow ranges anywhere from 5'6 to 6'4 and weighs anywhere from 100 to 150 pounds. This time it's the females that are coming in bigger at 5'6 to 6'8 weighing anywhere between 120 and 190 pounds. The drow come of age at 110 years. Their maximum age, 350 plus 4 percentage dice worth of years. Now let's get down to that character sheet, shall we? So we're doing two for one today. We're doing both the drow and the much stronger variant, the drow noble, two dark elves with one stone as it were. A regular drow gets a plus two to its dexterity and charisma, but a minus two to its con. These guys are nimble and manipulative but like elves, not the most hardy in the world. They're humanoids with the elf subtype. They're medium creatures with a base speed of 30 feet, and they can see perfectly in the dark, up to 120 feet with their superior dark vision. All drow are proficient with the hand, crossbow, rapier, and short sword. They're, of course, immune to magic sleep and get a plus two racial bonus on saving throws against enchantment spells and effects. These guys also have spell resistance, equal to six plus their total number of class levels. Like their surface cousins, drow receive a plus two racial bonus on perception checks, and they can use dancing lights, darkness, and fairy fire once per day, using their total character level as caster level. In addition, drow are skilled in the use of poisons, and they never risk accidentally poisoning themselves, but they do suffer from light blindness. Abrupt exposure to any bright light blinds a drow for a round, and they're dazzled as long as they remain in that area of bright light on subsequent rounds. Now we step into the world of the overpowered, air quotes, you can't see me throwing them, but I'm throwing them, a race with 41 RP, a race that will often get you kicked out of the table, and a race today that I'm here to tell you is perfectly reasonable in most games, and for all you GMs out there who are afraid of them, we'll talk about how you can build around them, build against them, pad your world against the might of the Drow Noble who receives a plus four to dexterity, plus two to intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, but a minus two to constitution. These guys have spell resistance equal to 11, plus their character level, and they can cast dancing lights, deeper darkness, fairy fire, feather fall, and levitate at will. They have detect magic as a constant spell-like ability. They can also cast divine favor, dispel magic, and suggestion once per day each. So far as the lore goes, about one out of every 20 drow is gifted with these special powers from birth. The overwhelming majority of these drow, of course, are female, and as a result, this is probably why drow societies are matriarchal in nature. These special births are engineered and encouraged among the ruling caste and are far more likely to occur when the mother is, in fact, a drow noble. Common drow children born to drow nobles are usually put to death, sacrificed to one of the many demon lords to whom the drow offer worship. It's rare for a drow noble to be born to common parents, but those who are usually murder their parents or family before they come of age in order to hide the truth of their base upbringings and to ease the process of joining one of their society's noble houses fun. Now, okay, before we talk about drow nobles in campaigns and stuff, we gotta talk about how the drow noble can be. I don't necessarily like to use the term because I feel like using the term rubs some people the wrong way, but it's the best way I can think to describe it. How to sideboard against the Drow Noble. Sideboarding is a term from Magic the Gathering. Well, I guess really from any TCG, you would have certain cards set aside that you might switch into your deck in between matches to increase your odds of victory against a certain kind of deck. And though the Drow Noble is pretty good with a little bit of tweaking, it's, I think, in my opinion, totally fair for the Drow Noble who, by the way, also gets everything we just talked about from the base drow, the ability to use poison, the proficiencies, the light blindness, etc. in your campaigns. I think the big one that a lot of people get afraid of is the deeper darkness that they can cast at will. Deeper darkness is a good spell. Yes, I agree with you. And I agree with everyone out there who's gasping as I talk about this. But deeper darkness only lowers the light by two steps. So if you're in an area of bright light, then it's dim light. Normal light becomes darkness. A lot of times you're probably in normal light, unless it's a very, very sunny day, and in that case, really, the Drown Noble's only casting it to get rid of its minus one 
And even then, I think a lot of the things you stereotypically fight in a given tabletop game will have dark vision anyway. The supernatural darkness can be a problem, but the drow noble themselves also can't see through it, so it's not like they're gonna obscure mist and walk away with stuff. And even if it becomes a problem, there are plenty of creatures out there with sea and darkness, tremor sense, blind sight, blind sense, true seeing, things of that nature that can well and truly get around this. And again, they're pretty common monsters that you're probably gonna find in the average Pathfinder game anyway. So this sideboard tech really isn't like breaking out something that no one's ever heard of. Oh, what's that? It must be there for the Drow Noble. No dude, you're just fighting earth elementals today. It is what it is. Featherfall and Levitate can help the Drow Noble cheat puzzles, but if the regular Drow was some kind of caster, they had access to these anyway. Detect Magic, truthfully, is just more on you to remember that it's out there so you can tell. And I screw this up a lot with Anru at Tale of Three Dragons, because yeah, I'm jamming for Drow Nobles right now. Because I forget it's a constant, really it just saves the players a couple of steps and a couple of dice rolls so they can just know that a thing is magic rather than have to determine it. Dispel Magic, Suggestion, and Divine Favor are good spells, but they're just once a day and again, if the player wants access to them, they're gonna get them anyway. It's not like once per day harm or miracle or something like that. The spell resistance is pretty high, and it might be something that's a little hard for your casters to get over, but one thing that a lot of us forget, I think, about spell resistance is that it's a blanket effect. Having your spell resistance up will stop the fireball that's coming at you. It will also stop the cure light wounds that tries to fix you when you get hit by something later. Of course, a creature can voluntarily lower its SR as a standard action, but then it just comes back up next turn. So an unconscious drow noble's spell resistance is gonna kick right back up if it doesn't have the standard action to lower. So if you start dying, the cleric can't come save you. Well, they can with other shenanigans, but that's beside the point. You get what I mean. The spell resistance is good, but it is in fact a double-edged sword. The ability score increases are pretty nice, and I'm not necessarily here to tell you that let your characters in a 15 point buy play a drow noble because okay, yeah, maybe those are a little too good. But we will note that Jason Bowman did say once that the Drow Noble should be one level less than characters of standard races. That's also fair, I think. If you're a little worried about your Drow Noble walking all over the meta, have it come in at one level lower. At level one, it has racial stuff and that's it. That gives your other players time to catch up, time to get out ahead, and time for you to see honestly if the player knows how to use a lot of these abilities that can seem to be pretty scary. I've GM'd for a Drow Noble four times in my career across three different players. The first time was in my first ever Pathfinder game before I knew what I was doing, before I knew anything about anything, before Black Dragon Gaming was even a thought in my mind. We were just meeting up once a week to throw dice around and laugh at that video of He-Man singing. <laughs> Yeah, you know the one. And the character was a drow noble druid who didn't know she had all this stuff. She, like me, we joined together and she was new at the game too, so I'm not like necessarily faulting her for it, but it happens. People want to play the thing that has the better stat buff, not realizing what spell resistance does, not knowing all the finer like aspects of rules and things. So in that case, ignorance of the rules was kind of the excuse, but since then, that same character returned in Attack on Tree Razor over at the end of Planar Crossroads, a one-shot I had the honor of GMing for him, where that character returned, in fact, of all things, as a shifter. And it was pretty good, I have to say. Shifters aren't as bad as we give them credit. They could have been maybe a little shinier, but meh, is what it is. And the stat buffs were nice, but again, it's not impossible for me to kill this character. The same is true present day for two of the players in our patron games. The Gentle Reaper over at the package, and like I said, Anru at Tale of Three Dragons, both playing Drow Nobles. If I want to kill him, I can. Really, that's, I guess, the second point I could make. If you're afraid of having Drow Nobles in the party, just up the numbers on your end. Anything the players can do, you can do with bigger numbers. And though that does kind of feel a little cheatsy sometimes, it is in fact a thing you can do. And Drow Culture is in fact really cool, and you don't see a lot of it without the Drow Noble. We can't all just play, you know, a ranger with a panther whose name is hard to pronounce and therefore I will not attempt it. But I hear there's like a book or a bajillion about him. Especially if the game takes place in the Darklands, something like a Drow Noble or Drow Nobles 
makes a lot of sense. And if I was to GM for Drow in more of a Darklands type setting, yeah, no, by all means, shackles are off. Drow Noble are on the table. They're usually on the table anyway in my games, but in that case, you almost have to. It also makes for pretty fun roleplay when that Drow or Drow Noble heads to the surface to begin an adventurer's life. Everybody who knows what a Drow is, and not everyone does, is gonna look at them a little cross-eyed because maybe they're gonna kill their children and sell the parts to flesh warpers or some other crazy kind of thing. And something like a drow paladin who's left those demon lords behind in favor of truth and light and Eomade or the god of your choice has that extra hurdle that they have to climb over to be accepted by the hoi polloi. The roleplay just writes itself, but what do you guys think? Have you ever GM'd for a drow noble in your games or a regular drow? Have you ever played a drow noble? And do you think it's fair for a Drow Noble to appear in a regular Pathfinder game? If so, throw it in the comments. I anticipate a lot of very good conversation on this one because it comes up a lot. But that's all we have for today. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe again if you want to see more of this craziness. The next episode of the Forgotten Race review where we're going back to Blood of the Moon and we're going to talk about the Rage Bread Skinwalker drops next Monday.